morning. If you'd stand with us, we'll go ahead and start singing our opening song here. Thank you, Lord. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord For all you've given to me For all the blessings that I cannot see Thank Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. Find someone you didn't say hi to this morning. Greet your neighbor. We're doing a short greet here. We're going to come back in for verse 2. For all you've done in my life, you took my darkness and gave me your light. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You took my sin and my shame. You took my sickness and healed all my pain. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Oh. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Blanchard Community Church. Uh, do we have any first time visitors today? Anybody visiting? Bring a guest today. I see a hand over there. Uh, we've got some blue, a blue card in the pew in front of you. Um, First of all, just we, we'd love to get to know you. If there's anything, uh, any prayer requests, anything you put on there, or if you're from the local area and just have questions or would like to be plugged in somehow looking for a home, uh, we'd love to get you some info on that. Uh, some announcements. Right after following church today, everyone's welcome to come downstairs. We have our annual Thanksgiving potluck. Um, just come and enjoy there. It looks like there's going to be more than enough food for everyone. So, um, Please come and join us for that. We've got the Christmas program, I believe December 19th. I didn't write it down here. 19th. Once again, just want to call that out. Uh, talk to Joan if you have something you'd like to do. If it's a music special, we've, we've had readings in the past. Um, we've even, I think at least once, maybe we had someone share a Christmas memory, a story, something like that. We're looking to fill up the service and and uh if that's a way you'd like to serve your brothers and sisters talk to joan about that um anything else randy it must not be he's not there did you have any other special announcements i missed um okay we're good why don't we go ahead and have are we still kevin on prayer and praise Oh, we got, oh, report. Margaret, are you prepared with a missions report? I apologize. Um, yes. Okay. She's going to talk about the boxes. Oh, yes, and we do have some boxes to talk about. We're, <laughs> boy, haven't thought about that since last week. Just, I'm as guilty as anyone. 
Margaret is on. I was waiting for the, but wait, there's more. But there wasn't. Yeah, I was ready for you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as with we, uh, what we've been doing this month is as Thanksgiving's month, is we've basically been focusing on just the Thanksgivings. We're a little short on time today, so if you have a prayer, please put it on the blue card and put it in the back. We'll make sure that it gets on the prayer chain. Because they're all important. The Lord knows what we need, and we just love having that relationship so we can talk to Him. So uh, we're also going to just say praises for the veterans that have sacrificed their lives or their time or you know time with their families to serve. We want to thank them. But I don't want to get too deep into that because Doug's got a, a, a deal for us on that. So I was just going to do a Thanksgiving prayer real quick and we'll move on. Okay? Bow your heads, please. Father, thank you for this time together. Uh, so uh, important our Blanchard family that uh, we spend time in fellowship, spend time studying your word to make us better, you know, students of your word because the understanding of your word is critical to our, our joy in our life present situation you know it's it's hard to look for th something to be thankful for but we have you and that's the major thing that we can be thankful for because it overrides everything else uh, these folks that are in charge can do anything they like but really they are all just under your uh, your your supreme guidance and uh whether we understand it or not uh, it's all for the bigger good and the long-term plan so we love you lord in your name amen Go ahead and come on up, worship team. We've had confusion over uh, order of service today, so <clears throat> I'm sure that's my fault. All right.
If you'd stand with us, we'll start out with uh, Come You Thankful People Come. pointing out that uh, if you're going through the daily bread reading uh, reading the Bible annually it was either was it today or yesterday it was today uh, Lamentations 3 well 22 through 23 the Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease for his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is your faithfulness there's just no coincidence you know so we didn't plan that
nothing has the power to say but your name. If you'd stand with us, we sang this one last week and uh, we wanted to double it back up because there was some, some confusion on the words, but. From the highest of heights Out to the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall To the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laid in with snow? Who imagined the sun and gave source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck we fall to our knees. As we humbly proclaim, you are the amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are the amazing God. Incomparable, unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. Amen. <clears throat> if you'd be seated, and Doug, if you'd come up to the stage. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> if you feel a tremor, it's my knees shaking. <laughs> uh, I was going to give a brief history of uh, Veterans Day, but I'd like you to all look it up. I don't think very many people know too much about Veterans Day, the 11th day, the 11th hour, or the 11th month. So look it up. It's very important. I think parts of our history are falling away and won't be taught much longer. <laughs> But the reason I wanted to talk today was because I wanted to honor the veterans. I've been in many situations where they honor veterans and it's a stand up and sit down and thank you. But there's a lot more to that. There's a lot more. I never use the term Happy Veterans Day. It's been 53 years since I went in the service and served my country and became a veteran. And there's never been a happy Veterans Day. There's been good days. But it's always been a day of retrospect, of respect, and 
consideration for men who served. And before I get along too far, I would like all our veterans to stand up, please. Thank you, gentlemen, thank you. And we do have a lady veteran, but I don't see her here today. And if there are one, I'm sorry I missed it. Today I'd like you all to take a look at this as you can. This little display, there's a lot of service and sacrifice that's put on that table. From World War II to Korea to Vietnam, out in the sandboxes and in the mountains of Afghanistan, <coughs> and various and other black op, ops or op operations around the world that we never know about. As veterans, we all go in harm's way when we take that oath. And it doesn't matter what we do or what job we have. We all are in harm's way. We all serve. It's all about the mission. It's all about serving our country. So you deserve, you deserve more than just thank you. But that's kind of about all we have to offer, you know, other than support and praise for what you've done. We served our country, and we served our nation, and we served each other. And a lot of us came out with problems. Our wives know, our best friends know. There are times that Veterans just kind of disappear in a fog. I know my wife has bumped me on the shoulder a time or two and just said, don't go there. But this time of year, you go there. And the only thing that we have that's different than the rest of the veterans out here, and I speak for only the veterans in this room, we served our country, now we serve a risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And he can get us through all things. Thank you. Amen. Doug so asked if, uh, if you'd all join us with an acapella singing of God Bless America. And I wanted to, I've had a couple people over the years say, they did, you know, ask the question, is America worthy of, of God blessing it. And I, I would say it, in this song, I, you know, in the first part of the, the verse, um, we're, we're asking that God come beside her and guide, guide the country with a light from above. So I focus on that part when I think about this song. And it's, it's not that we're led in such a godly manner, but that we can go to any part of the, the world, the, the country, the town that God has us in, and we can be the America that we're looking to bless and, and we'll glorify God with that. But if you <coughs> sing this with me here. God bless America land that I love stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet for standing for I'm already standing but uh, <laughs> you can read Kevin thank you good morning <laughs> scripture reading today Galatians 5 13 14 5 13 14 you my brothers and sisters were called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you, 
Eric. Um, we are going to pick up the Sermon on the Mount next year. I know it sounds like it's a long ways away, but it is not. It is not. Um, we are going to talk this morning about freedom. When you think of Veterans Day, you have to, somewhere along the line, connect the dots of the word freedom and free. And we're going to look at it from the Bible's perspective in this verse. And it says, for you were called to freedom, brethren. You know, this is a very defining portion of Scripture on how we need to understand freedom in the life of a Christian. There has been through the centuries actually very much discussion about what Christian freedom is. And in Galatians 2.4, the Apostle Paul talked about our liberty, the liberty that we have in Christ, the same as freedom. Galatians 5 begins, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. And then down in verse 13, it says, you were called to freedom, brethren. Jesus Christ's sacrificial death on the cross is the reason that you were set free. But free from what? But free from what? Now, I realize freedom in our culture can be a very dangerous word. It has become misinterpreted and misrepresented in many ways, even in the evangelical world. And certainly we see it in the church world. People in our culture want freedom. They demand freedom. They want to be free to think what they want and to do what they want. You might think this is something new. And in our culture, it certainly is escalating to new heights. But it isn't new at all. In fact, if you go back about 3,000 years ago... You have a society of people doing exactly this. And it is the Israelites in the days of the judges. And this is what it says in Judges uh, 17.6 and in 21.25. It says, they wanted to do whatever is right in our own eyes. This is the kind of society we live in today. Now, in order to do that, you have to make sure that you get the Bible out of the way. Because the Bible condemns much of what people want to do. So there has to be a denunciation of the Bible and the role that the Bible plays in our society. Years ago, you remember them tearing down the Ten Commandments everywhere. You need to get the Bible out of schools. You need to get the Bible out of the public discourse because if people bring up the Bible, it's going to encroach on someone's freedom. Laws are fast being installed that are leading to one goal and one goal only, to make, biblically Christian, to make biblical Christianity a crime. But that is what it is about to silence the word of God. Our society wants to be free from any moral restraints. But this is not freedom. It is a sin addiction. All he human beings, if you haven't realized it, apart from the gospel and salvation in Christ, are sin addicts. In fact, the whole human race is made up of sin addicts. You used to be one. We need to look at the entire human race, not as people who are free, but as people who are addicted to sin. And it's an, it is an addiction that they can't break, and it's killing them. And death is not just physical, it is eternal. And there is no soft way to peddle this truth, for all have sinned and fall short. Of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. In John 8.36 it says, Only if Christ sets you free are you really free. So what people in our society think is freedom is simply a more extreme public unrestrained manifestation of their addiction to iniquity. 
Only Jesus Christ sets us free from that addiction to sin. In the past, our culture, there, in the past, in our culture, there were, was some sort of social restraints. I remember that as a kid. There were some limits that society put on people. There were certain expectations. In fact, you go back a few decades, and there was a kind of general sense of goodness. There was a general sense of the importance of family. There was a time when people had mothers, and they had fathers, and they had families, and there was a sense of morality. And there were behaviors that had shame built into them, and you didn't flaunt them, you hid them. All that is gone in our society today. In fact, there were literally millions of people who went to war for this country and other countries who died for the well-being of people. They would never meet who had ever been born before when they went to war, and this was very sacrificial on their point. But that was what people did in a more nobler time. Now there's a mad rush into every imaginable, unimaginable form of sin, and it's flaunted. This has become a problem for the church as well, because at the same time the world is running rapidly after this so-called freedom, the church has decided it needs to be free and take on the characteristics of the world and the methods of the world. So you have many churches developing today that do not talk about righteousness, holiness, godliness, and their responsibility to their neighbors. Not at any point can we talk about these things. They can't really talk to the believers in church about it. They can't make it an issue for them, or it exposes the non-believers. So to accommodate the sinners who have gone to church with their sin, many pastors are now calling for a new kind of Christian life. A Christian life where the church feels it has the freedom to do whatever is right in its own eyes. Here's a quote from one of these new false church leaders. It says, freedom and fun must be reinstated into our faith so that those non-Christians will be attracted. Grace has saved us from sin and freed us from any obligation and duty. The living out this freedom is difficult because there are so many grace killers. Now, you might ask yourself, what is a grace killer? Well, they've defined it for us. Here's their definition of a grace killer. Narrow-minded, judgmental, intolerant bullies who impose bondage on Christians and kill freedom. Spontaneity, creativity, productivity, and joy. These grace killers are judgmental, intolerant bullies who impose righteous standards on Christians. I wonder if they understand what the word Christian means. These churches and leaders think that when they were converted, they were freed from the law of God to sin rather than being freed from sin to obey the law. And the reality is that tolerance of sin celebrates bondage, not freedom. Your freedom in Christ is not freedom to sin. Your freedom in Christ is freedom for the first time to do righteous deeds. Your addiction is broken. Do we sin occasionally? Yes. But the addiction to sin is broken. We now have a heart craving to do what is right, what is righteous. Paul is deny, in this verse, Paul is not denying our freedom. We have freedom. We are free, he says in Galatians 3.13, and we are free from the curse of God. The curse of God is in the verse 10 of chapter 3, and it says, Cursed is everyone who doesn't abide by all the things written in the book of the law, to perform them. 
James adds that if you break just one point of the law, you have broken all of it. But Christ has freed us from the cursed. How did he do that? Well, if you just look at verse 13, it says, He redeemed us from the curse, having become a curse for us. So we are free from the law's curse. We are free from the long, fruitless search for liberating truth. You're free from that because when you came to Christ, you found the truth. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We're free from rituals. We're free from the externals in the Old Testament. Those were the things the Jews did when they came to Galatia to impose on the Gentiles, Paul says. We're free from all those things, but mark this. You are not free from the holy standards of God. God has expectations for His children. If you're a true believer... You have not been set free from the responsibility and duty to God. You have been set free from your iniquity addiction to do what honors God. Freedom for the Christian is freedom from sin and death and hell and all those external religious features. In Galatians 3.13, Paul says, You were called to freedom, brethren. When he uses the word brethren, he's talking to Christians. He says, only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. What do you mean by the flesh? Paul uses the term flesh 91 times. It is the Greek word sarx. Now, if someone says, I don't know any Greek, you just got it. Sarx. Flesh can refer to certain individuals or it can refer to humanity in general. But primarily, Paul uses the term flesh in a spiritual sense, and that is how it is used in this verse. What does flesh mean in verse 13? Flesh means your remaining humanity, your unredeemed humanity. It's the part of you that hasn't been redeemed. You're a new creation. You've been born again. You are brand new. In fact, that change is bigger than what will occur at your death. The change was transformation when you were saved. Your death will be simply a subtraction. You don't become an eternal blessed new creation when you die. You simply get rid of what restrains that sin nature. So here we are, new creations, incarcerated in this unredeemed flesh. In fact, Paul said, I look at my own life and there's something in me that responds to temptation and sin. He says, and this is what he says, it's not me, but it's in my flesh. And the flesh is that part of us that's not redeemed until we have the redemption of the body that he talks about in Romans chapter 8. Until that day, we have this flesh remaining. There is an anti-God, hostile reality in you as a believer. It's in you. It is you. And it battles against the new creature, the new man, the new creation in Christ. If you haven't realized it yet, you have a war going on inside of you. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, The flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Paul almost sounds here, and especially when you get into Romans chapter 7, he sounds like a schizophrenic, doesn't he? He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I hate, I do. And then he gets into that whole discourse there. You have a war going on inside of you. That describes the Christian life. 
The only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is a Christian is a sinner. A non-Christian is, or a Christian is a sinner that's saved by grace. A non-Christian is just a sinner. Have you ever had anyone say to you, oh, you Christians think you're so perfect? Boy, they don't really know us well, do they? The addiction to sin is broken. But there's still in you an attraction to that sin drug. You're weak at that point in your flesh. We all are. It is the unredeemed nature that becomes the attack point for the temptation and the bridge to sin. It is the battleground for every believer. That's the battle going on. And what does your flesh want to do? Well, look at the further definition as it goes on in Galatians 5.19. It says, here is what the flesh does. Here are the deeds of the flesh. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity. Now, knowing all of you, probably none of these things on this list applies to you. But the list goes on, and this is really where the rubber hits the road. It says strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. That is what the flesh wants. That is what the flesh produces. And there will always be that battle, although the power of flesh will decrease as you become more like Christ in the process of sanctification. If you do not spend time in prayer, if you do not spend time in God's Word, and I mean studying God's Word, not just reading it. I have never been big on reading through the Bible. If a person wants to do that, that's between them and the Lord. I would rather have a person do, as David says, he meditated on the word of God so that he might not sin against God. It's meditating, thinking through, studying the word of God that brings stability and brings maturity to your life. But in the meantime, how do we battle this flesh? Well, verse 16 gives us the answer. It says, walk by or in the Spirit. Notice it's a big S, which is talking about the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So what do you mean by walk in or by or in the Spirit? It means to walk in perfect conformity in the Holy Spirit. Walk in holiness. So you're free for the first time in your life. That addiction is broken. You are free from the complete bondage of sin. You are not free to sin, but you are free to do what is right. And, to, and do not, he says in verse 13, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Do not make the flesh, as you might say, the base of your operations. Opportunity is an interesting word in the Greek. Opportunity means a military base, and it pictures the believer as a military entity. And Satan wants to come with all his forces and attack us. So don't make the flesh your base of operations. You have an enemy, and the enemy is not beside you this morning. The enemy is not around you. The enemy is where? In you. And if you come up with some sort of sound, heretical notion of the Christian life that you're free to sin, there's plenty of reason to ask yourself whether or not you are walking in the Spirit. So when Paul talks about freedom in Christ, God, through the Apostle Paul, says, we are free from the bondage of sin. 
We are free from the condemnation of the law. We are free from the disappointment of the hopeless search for truth because you found it. We are free from the penalty of sin. We are free from the Old Testament's complex ceremonies and rituals that were established for Israel. But not free from the moral law, but rather to obey that law because it's merely of a reflection of the God we love. And this freedom is in the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who empowers us to live this freedom. So be free indeed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that you did pay the ultimate penalty for our sins. And because of that, when we stand before our almighty God, we will stand as one of his children. I love that verse that says there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because you paid the penalty for our sin. And Lord, I cannot imagine every time I've read that passage of Scripture when you died on the cross and you said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What that was like. And yet, Lord, because you paid the penalty, you shed your blood on the cross, we have that sin addiction broken. May each and every day as your children, may we encourage one another and all the more as we see that day approaching and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. If you'd stand for our closing song, give thanks. today from the book of John, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So let's live in and show God's love to those around us this week. Have a blessed week.